my channel. Today I have another true crime ASMR video for you. Today's video will be added to my true crime ASMR series playlist where you can find past and future videos in this series. I would like to say thank you to all of you who subscribe and take the time to relax and hang out with me. I appreciate the time you have taken. intentions for you. And I hope that is felt through my videos. Now, today's video is another requested true crime case. Today's video was requested by Laura Yvette. recommended the Menendez Brothers case, which has a lot to unpack. A lot. So, today's video will probably be a long one. We'll see how it unfolds. Now, this case has very mixed opinions. However, I will be saving mine, as always, for the end of this video. But my thoughts may be pretty apparent by all the information that I tell you. Um, I don't leave anything out. I know that kind of makes it sound like I'm fitting a narrative, but I'm not. I'm just telling you the whole line of events from when Jose and Kitty grew up, which a lot of the time you can kind of see foreshadowing in people's lives by the background kind of gives us a setup to how they got to where they ended up and why some crimes had happened. So, we will dive in to the Menendez Brothers case. I'll be starting this video like usual starting with the backgrounds of all involved, and then the crime. So, Jose Enrique Menendez was born on May 6, 1944. He was a Cuban-American business executive in the entertainment industry. Jose was born in Havana, Cuba as the youngest child and only son of Jose Francisco Pepin Menendez and Maria Carlotta. He had two older sisters and 
He was from a successful upper middle class family and his father was a professional soccer player who went on to own his own accounting firm. His mother, Maria, was on the women's national swim team and had won five gold medals. Jose's childhood was met with little to no discipline due to what his siblings called his mother's darling. Due to Jose's outspoken attitude, um, he had been um, part of political groups and protesting during the year 1960, and his family was fearful that he would be arrested or something bad would happen. So his mother sent him to the United States when he was 16 years old. So, Jose would start attending Southern Illinois University and there he would meet Mary Louise Anderson or, as she would be known to most of us, as Kitty. Kitty, 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 Kitty. They would quickly become a couple, and within weeks started talking about marriage. Neither of their families initially approved of the relationship. Jose's parents were disapproving because Kitty was a child of divorce, and Kitty's parents disapproved because Jose was Cuban. After Kitty graduated, the couple eloped in 1963 and moved to New York City. including his sisters, co-workers, and sons, would describe him as sadistic. Some examples were the fact that Jose was known for ridiculing others and finding joy in making people feel upset, inferior, 
or embarrassed. He found joy in telling people that Kitty had cancer and seeing them treat her delicately. His neighbor, Alicia Hertz, talked about how Jose would put on pornography at dinner and would find it amusing how uncomfortable it would make people feel. The boys Sports coaches would describe his relationship with his sons as abusive and sadistic. Jose was known for ordering escorts while the family had lived in Calabasas. Sherry Woods, who was a well-known madam, who provided escorts to the Hollywood elites, would tell the New York Post that Jose would physically assault escorts, beat them, and pretend to rape them. And when the escorts returned, they would be terrified and crying. Jose was also known for requesting underage escorts. Jose's nephew, Alan Anderson, would testify, stating that Jose would inflict pain endurance tests on his sons and Alan, stating Jose would pick Alan up under his armpits so hard that it would leave bruises. Kitty Menendez was born on October 14th. 1941. Her parents were Charles and May Anderson. Charles was an army veteran who owned his own air conditioning and heating business. And her mother worked in an airport. Charles very abusive towards his children. And when Kitty was young, her father left her mother for a younger woman, and they would get divorced. After the divorce, Kitty's mother would turn to alcohol and Kitty would be sent to a boarding school after her sibling, Joan, suspected her of being sexually abused by a relative. Kitty would go on to college and would win beauty pageants as Jose's career crew when the couple had children, Kitty would decide to become a stay-at-home mom. As the children grew older, the couple's relationship would grow farther apart due to what was a reported obsession.
Jose was upset with Jose's repeated extramarital affairs. Briefly, she would leave the family home, only for Jose to convince her to come home for the kids. Her son Lyle would describe his mom as a woman who was in a lot of pain and was abused by her husband, both emotionally and physically. Kitty had become depressed and had even overdosed on Xanax. After Jose had accepted a job offer from Live Entertainment, the family would move to California, despite Kitty's dismay. Kitty had built a life for herself in New Jersey, and Jose, Jose would offer for Kitty to stay in New Jersey with Lyle due to him expecting to attend college there. Kitty would quickly turn down the idea, probably because she knew what was going on with Jose and his son Eric, let alone she didn't want to look even more like a fool because of Jose's affairs. The family would move to Calabasas, and the son, Eric, would state that while in California, the couple seemed better. Jose even treating Kitty better. While in California, Kitty became extremely involved in her son's sex lives. More so with Eric, since she feared he was gay. She would then give her son a deadline to find a girlfriend when he started school at Calabasas High School which Eric would barely meet. Kitty would despise all girlfriends Lyle would have due to her obsession with her son. And the family would only stay in Calabasas for two years after the siblings were involved with local burglaries, which they would move from Calabasas to Beverly Hills. Now, due to the increase in burglaries, Kitty would begin keeping shotguns in her wardrobe. So, now we're going to break down the early lives of the sons, Lyle and Eric Menendez. Now, Lyle and Eric spent much of their early childhoods growing up in the affluent suburbs of New York and New Jersey. The brothers attended Princeton Day School in New Jersey. Early on, both of them were challenged by their father to pick a sport to excel at. Lyle would participate in soccer and swimming before focusing on tennis. Lyle would become 
regarded as a very strong tennis player, and I, Eric idolized him. It would soon be apparent the brothers had very different personalities, and yet the brothers were extremely close. In the school, Lyle would excel and excel in tennis and begin dating a tennis player as well. Um, in his teens, Lyle's hair would begin thinning and his father would make him get a toupee, which he would wear into the 90s. Eric would struggle in school and it would later be discovered that he had an auditory processing disorder as well as dyslexia that his parents never um, treated him for. At Princeton Day School, Eric was a shy and withdrawn child, and Lyle was a very popular, like, elite kid. When the family moved to Calabasas, Eric would flourish and become quite popular. Um, Lyle would get accepted into Princeton and would move back to New Jersey. Eric would meet a friend called Greg and the two would begin burglarizing homes in the Calabasas area. And soon after Eric or Lyle, Lyle had been dismissed from school due to bad grades and had been staying with his parents and the brothers would soon take up brothers would get caught, and they had reportedly stole $100,000 worth of stolen items. Jose would force them to return the items, any that weren't able to be returned. He would pay for out of pocket. Um, it was reported that Jose was not upset that the boys burglarized, but more upset that they got caught. Jose and his lawyer would make a deal with the police department that Eric would take all the blame. The family would move to Beverly Hills due to the burglaries. Now, Jose's relationship with his sons is a very important for the events that will unfold in the year of 1989. His sick obsession with his oldest son, Lyle, was highly noted. Jose would have hour-long talks with Lyle, imposing many philosophies, and um, Jose would have him read self-help books that Jose had, like, edited all the things that he didn't agree with, and left the rest for his son to read. Jose was described as physically, psychologically, and sexually abusive towards his sons. Um, Lyle, he would attempt to control every aspect of his life, such as where he went to school, his career, and who Lyle would marry. 
Jose would punish Lyle for crying by punching him or sending him away. Eventually, he would teach Lyle to stop crying on command. Menendez would be described as the throwaway son. Jose would isolate Eric, putting all of his time into Lyle. Lyle would describe Jose as being very rough towards Eric and reported Jose beginning to sexually abuse Eric when he was only six years old. Jose would continue this the rest of his life. As Eric got older, the abuse would become more sadistic and painful. In 1976, Lyle had revealed to his cousin, Diane Vandermolen, that his father was constantly sexually abusing him. On June 28th, 1989, Eric would graduate from Beverly Hills High School, planning to go to UCLA. Jose would, however, not allow him to attend college from home, nor would he allow him to stay in a dorm. Lyle, at this time, had been suspended from school, and he would soon be hired at Jose's um, job, live entertainment. During the summer of 1989, Lyle would date multiple women. It is reported he had gotten a girl pregnant, to which Jose would force them to have an abortion and break up. On August 19th, 1989, the family would go shark fishing with motion picture marines. The boat operator, Bob Anderson, described the atmosphere with the family very tense and remembered the siblings avoiding their parents the entire trip. In the evening of August 20th, 1989, while in the family room of their Beverly Hills home, Kitty and Jose were shot and killed by their sons, Lyle and Eric, who were both armed with their Mossberg 12-gauge shotguns. Jose was shot six times, whereas his wife was shot ten times. By the time the siblings had emptied their weapons, Jose sat dead on the couch while Kitty Lai dying beside him in a pool of her own blood. The brothers left the family home and Lyle, no, the brothers would leave the family room. And Lyle would reload his weapon, re-enter the family room, and shoot Kitty in the face, killing her. Kitty was 47. Jose was 45. The brothers would call the police and wait for them at the home after 
disposing of all the evidence, tying them to the murder. The crime had been committed at 10 p.m. The brothers waiting until 11.47 to call authorities. Lyle would claim he and his brother had come home from a movie to find their parents dead. Authorities would question the story from the beginning, but had no physical evidence to tie them to the crime. On August 25th, 1989, the family held a funeral service for the couple in Princeton, New Jersey, where they were laid to rest in Princeton Cemetery. Eric would not speak at the memorial service. Lyle, however, would deliver a eulogy. Shortly after, the brothers would meet with the heads of Live Entertainment, the company Jose was a CEO of. They would be seeking what assets were available for them. Lyle had started to vaguely suggest that his parents' deaths might have been due to his father's shady business connections and people involved with the mob. The brothers claimed to fear for their lives after their parents' murders and had hired bodyguards. They would begin staying in luxury hotels and max out Jose's credit card on room service. So, the brothers would immediately receive money from their father's life insurance policy. Lyle would be the highest spending of the two, buying Armani suits, Rolex watches, a new Porsche, a penthouse apartment, a chicken wing restaurant, and a stock company. The only sibling to show remorse and a real struggle after the murders was Eric, who briefly moved in with a friend due to his need for support after the murders. Eric would begin seeing a therapist named Dr. Jerome Ozeal for regular appointments and on October 31st, 1989, he would confess to the murders. That same day, Dr. Ozeal would call Lyle and inform him what Eric had told him. Lyle would then arrive at the office, expressing great anger towards Eric for confessing. Eric would become increasingly agitated and upset due to feeling guilty that he had displeased his brother Lyle. It was revealed that Eric had confessed to another person, Craig Signorelli, about the crime prior to his therapy sessions. Police 
would question Craig and attempt to have him wear a wire in the hopes Eric would confess a second time, which they were unsuccessful. In December, Eric and Lyle would agree to taped therapy sessions with Dr. Ozeal, which I don't know why you would. Like, he just called, called your brother to tell him what you had confessed to. And then for Lyle to be like, yeah, this sounds like a good idea. He just called me and exposed everything my brother just said. He won't tell anybody else, of course not. Um, Ozeal had stated that the deep therapy sessions could possibly help build a defense for the brothers if they were ever to be convicted. During the sessions, the brothers would mention the killings and state that they killed Jose due to his overbearing presence in their lives and sexual abuse. Their mother's murder was what they claimed to be as a mercy killing due to knowing she would never be able to live without her fa- without their father. Now, during this time, Dr. Ozeal had a mistress named Jude Mon Smythe and she would inform the police that she knew that the siblings had confessed to the murders and that Ozeal had it on tape. Lyle would be arrested on March 8th, 1990, while Eric was out of the country. Eric would return to the US and be arrested March 11th, 1990. Both would be held at Los Angeles County Men's Jail. The siblings were indicted by the LA County Grand Jury on December 8th of the same year. Their first trial took place from July 20th, 1993 to January 1994. The second trial would span from August 23rd, 1995 to March 20th, 1996. From the start of the proceedings, it was a media circus. Popular cable networks would broadcast the proceedings from inside the courtroom. The prosecution would argue that the brothers simply wanted control of the family's Leslie Abramson argued that the killings were not motivated by money, rather arguing that Jose had sexually abused his sons for years while Kitty did nothing to stop it, and sometimes physically abusing the brothers herself. The trial saw testimony from both brothers, as well as a therapist, Dr. Ozeal. Prior to closing arguments being made on December 3rd, 1993. After about a month of deliberations, the juries and the Menendez brothers' murder trial were hopelessly deadlocked, left 
with no choice. Superior Judge Stanley Weisberg declared mistrials on January 13th and January 28th for both siblings. It later was revealed that the jury was split along gender lines. The male jurors were in favor of conviction, while the women were not. People who are sexualized by men. Anyway, during the second trial that began in 1995, the same arguments were made. Eric would spend several weeks on the stand where he claimed, among other things, that his father was a killer who feared would kill again. Now, what I think he meant by this, Eric was discarded his whole life. Um, I really do think that he had got the brunt of the abuse. Um, Lyle was this gifted and loved son, so I really do think that Eric had gotten the real, like, a lot of the abuse, and he had really killed him inside. I really do think that's what he means. Unless he really did kill somebody. You know. (laughs) Anyway. In this trial, Lyle would not testify. And after three weeks of deliberation on March 20th, 1996, the jury would return a guilty verdict against Lyle and Eric Menendez for first-degree murder. On July 2nd, both were sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Prosecution would doubt that the brothers had ever been sexually or physically abused due to no evidence that Jose had ever done those acts besides hearsay. The defense argued the brothers were victims of child abuse, so hideous and long-lasting that it forced them to kill in self-defense. Lyle and Eric would file several appeals following 1996 guilty verdict. In 1998, both the California Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court of California upheld their convictions. The brothers would then file habeas corpus petitions with the U.S. District Court, which were denied in 2003. The brothers would file more habeas corpus petitions, which means that they weren't um, rightfully um, defended. Um, They would do multiple habeas corpus petitions, and in 2005, um, they were all denied, and they had exhausted their final appeal option. The brothers have, however, filed another habeas corpus petition as new evidence had been found as of this year. So, new evidence has been brought forward that could overturn the case entirely. Letters have been found from Eric to his cousin describing his fear of his father's um, abuse. Um, He has stated his fear of his father coming into his room. And the letter was dated the year 1988. So Eric was like 17, 18 at this time. 
the letter had not been used in either of the trials in the 90s, and the petition also includes reports of abuse by Roy Rossello. He had been in the Latin band Menudo in the 80s, and he was repeatedly raped by Jose while his band was signed to his company, RCA Records. Attorneys argue these two pieces of evidence counters prosecutors' narrative that Jose was not violent or the type of person who would abuse his children. Their attorneys state, in short, the new evidence not only shows that Jose Menendez was very much a violent and brutal man who would sexually abuse children, but it strongly suggests that, in fact, he was still abusing Eric Menendez as late as December 1988, just as the defense had argued all along. Attorneys are asking the court to either vacate the conviction and sentence against the brothers, or permit discovery and an evidentiary hearing when they can provide proof per the document. In the 21 years since the verdict, the brothers have married in prison, Eric in 1999, and Lyle twice in 96 and 2003. Um, they have remained active in person close despite being over 500 miles apart. Both brothers married despite at first, not being able to see these women, so I just, <laughs> they really got women by pen pal. <laughs> um, which I love that and find that so interesting. <laughs> um, Lyle had been married twice, so he's a good pen pal. Alright, so that is today's video. Um, it did end up being pretty long, <laughs> but there was so much to unpack in this case that I really wanted to break down with you. Um, so now for my closing thoughts. Okay, so I will like to first state I, like many, do not condone murder. I do not condone it. But I do, however, believe that this kind of abuse, manipulation, and upbringing takes a toll, and I really do think that it took a toll on both of these siblings. Now, these brothers were really trapped in this world with their father. I just really do sympathize with them. There's been studies that say how abuse like this traps victims at the ages of their abuse. Um, Eric had been suffering by himself with Jose and his mother sexually being abused. Now, all those years they do have so many people that report knowing of this abuse and nothing was done. I think Eric was burglarizing homes in the hopes that someone would hear him. Um, he felt trapped with his father, trapped with his mother, and I think he was just screaming for someone to notice, and Lyle had just left him there. So it's just, they were close, obviously, and Eric 
idolized his brother, but Lyle really did just leave him there. Um, I think in this case, personally, I think Lyle was the mastermind. Um, I think after Jose had broken up his relationship with his previous girlfriend and demanded them get an abortion, that takes a toll. Um, we've learned that both parents were very controlling of his both the siblings' sex life, and um, I think that really pushed Lyle over the edge. He never had any control over his life outside of his father, and he had found this woman was going to have a child with her, and Jose took that away from him. They could have eloped, but I mean, realistically, this is all this these children have known um, is their father and his money and he had, it seems as if he is ingrained in them that there's nothing outside of him um, there's a lot of manipulation and control clearly but I think Lyle was in charge and the mastermind and I think Kitty's obsession with his sex life and being so judgmental of the women that he would bring just a lot of anger and I think Eric was done being abused and partook in the crime um, it's just very sad I do think that they should have been punished I'm not saying that they shouldn't have been punished but I think that they should have been charged as juveniles and I think 20 years should have been given to them where it was in comparison to the amount of years of abuse where they would be serving time in psychi psychiatric facilities I think that would have made more sense personally to make up for the ab years of abuse in a appropriate setting. I don't think two men like them would just fake abuse. And from all the people around Jose, it's clear he was not a good man. And their mother, I'm sure more occurred there than we know. With drug and alcohol abuse, um, it runs in Kitty's family. She saw it in her mother. The abuse from her father to her. There's no doubt Jose was abusing her as well. And I think their relationship improved in Calabasas because he was able to be with the escorts and traumatize them and abuse them and not Kitty. So that probably was good for her. She probably did enjoy it there. The abuse was not solely on her. Um, but she had to have seen the way her husband was traumatizing them. I feel the minute my boyfriend gets out of bed. I've been married to this man. You're a stay-at-home mom. Um, I feel bad because these boys were so traumatized by this man, and she did one time it was just Kitty, Jose, and Eric. She was a stay-at-home mom. What else do you have to do besides protect your children? <laughs> anyway, Loriva, I hope that you enjoyed this video. Um, I knew that when you recommended something, it would I knew it would be good, and I knew it would be a long video, so I really enjoyed researching and learning about this case, and um, I hope that you enjoyed it and found it relaxing. Um, thank you so much for all who subscribe, and um, if you like this content and would like to see more of it, and you are not subscribed, I highly suggest tapping the subscribe.